Ladies and gentlemen, let's have a warm National Press Club welcome for Mr. George Carlin. I'm not here to advance any political, social, or environmental cause. I am, in fact, blessedly agenda-free. I don't want to save the river, I don't want to save the bay, I don't want to save the canyon, the whale, the wetlands, the rainforest, or the flying spotted dwarf, something or other. I don't want to save the children, above all, frankly. <laughs> frankly, I don't care about many of those things, and be between you and me, those battles were lost a long time ago. I'm not interested in freeing someone, boycotting something, or preventing anything. I am interested in keeping my lunch inside my mouth if I can. And I don't want to make something optional. I refuse to wear ribbons of any color. You might say I'm just here to help define deviancy down. <laughs> to be honest, there aren't many things I do believe in, but high among them would be friendship, family ties, and romantic love. I think those things can take you a long way. For the record, the only worthy cause I have devoted time to is a little-known place that does wonderful work, St. Anthony's Home for the Visually Unpleasant. <laughs> It's, it's run by the Little Sisters of the Heinous. And in fact, they operate a number of facilities. The Rochester Home for the Permanently Disheveled, the New England Haven for the Occasionally Coherent, and the Catholic Shelter for those who up until a year ago seemed to be doing just fine. I thought it might be nice today for me to come to you with some of my language complaints. Certainly not to blame them on you, although of course you are implicated. And not that you can help it. I mean, the problem is really with the people you cover, the politicians, the celebrities, and the lawyers. And although their level of insincerity is astonishing, it's still kind of fun to hear them talk. In particular, it's fun to listen to Washington talk. Whenever the issue of term limits comes up, I always tell people the only term limits I'm interested in would be to limit some of the terms used by politicians. They speak, of course, with great caution because they must take care not to actually say anything. <laughs> Proof of this, according to their own words, is that they don't actually say things, they indicate them. As I indicated yesterday, and as the president indicated to me, <laughs> but sometimes they don't indicate, they suggest. Let me suggest that as I indicated yesterday, <laughs> I haven't determined that yet. See, they don't decide, they determine. If it's a really serious matter, they make a judgment. I haven't made a judgment on that yet. When the hearings are concluded, I will make a judgment, or I might make an assessment. I'm not sure. I haven't determined that yet. But when I do, I will advise you. They don't tell, they advise. I advised him that I had made a judgment. Thus far, he hasn't responded. They don't answer, they respond. He hasn't responded to my initiative. An initiative is an idea that isn't going anywhere. <laughs> when he responds to my initiative, I will review his response, take a position, and make a recommendation. See, they don't read, they review, they don't have opinions, they take positions, and they don't give advice, they make recommendations. And so, at long last, after each has responded to the other's initiatives, and each has reviewed the other's responses, and everyone has taken a position, made a judgment, and offered a recommendation, now they have to do something. <laughs> but that would be much too direct. So instead, they address the problem. We're addressing the problem, and we'll soon be proceeding. That's a big activity here in Washington. <laughs> proceeding. They're always proceeding or moving forward. A lot of that goes on. Senator, have you solved that problem? Well, we're moving forward on that. And when they're not moving forward, they're moving something else forward, such as the process. We have to move the process forward so we can implement the provisions of the initiative in order to meet these challenges. No one has problems anymore. Challenges. That's why we need people who can make the tough decisions. Tough decisions like how much soft money can I expect to collect in exchange for my core values? <laughs> so that... So that I can continue my work in government. Of course, no politician would admit to such a lowly station as working in government, serving the nation. 
us. I'm serving the nation. Another favorite distortion is public service. I'm in public service. I like America, don't you? The food is great, but the public service is terrible. <laughs> now, folks, a question for you. Do you think it's possible that one of these politicians, whose judgment is so poor that he honestly thinks of himself as serving the nation, might occasionally be expected to indulge in a little patriotism? Huh? What do you think? Well, of course, not only is it possible, it's inevitable, and that's when he's at his very best. That's when he trots out the really good stuff all across this great land of ours, the greatest nation on earth, the greatest nation in the history of the world. And in times of military crisis, you can be sure that someone in a suit in this town will eventually plant himself in front of a camera and carry on a great deal about the most powerful nation on the face of the earth. Now, normally, during peacetime, the politicians will refer to people in the military as our young men and women stationed around the world. But in wartime, they quickly become our brave young fighting men and women stationed halfway around the world in places whose names they can't pronounce, wondering if they'll ever see their loved ones again. <laughs> for added emotional impact, sons and daughters can always be substituted for men and women. And so I think we can sum this up by saying that where the military is concerned, the extent of a politician's insincerity can be measured by how far around the world our, station, our soldiers are stationed and whether or not any of them can pronounce it. <laughs> Incidentally, another way of expressing this sentiment is to say we're sending our young men and women to places the average American can't find on a map. I've always thought it was kind of funny and somewhat out of character for a politician to go out of his way to point out the low level of American intelligence <laughs> when indeed his very job depends upon it. It would seem to fly in the face of that other rhetorical standby of theirs, the American people are a lot smarter than they're given credit for. This is said with a straight face, although it is obvious, of course, that the proposition is being stated precisely backwards. But. But the politicians, God bless them, or something like that, they're at their most entertaining when they're in trouble. When they're in trouble, their explanations usually begin simply with words like miscommunication. What did you do wrong, Senator? Well, it was a miscommunication. Or I was quoted out of context. Better yet, and more ironic, they twisted my words. Such a nice touch. A person who routinely spends his days torturing the language complains, they twisted my words. <laughs> Then, as the controversy continues to heat up, he moves to his next level of complaint. The whole thing has been blown out of proportion. The whole, it's always the whole thing. Apparently, no one has ever claimed that only a small portion of something was blown out of proportion. It has to be the whole thing. That's because now he's feeling the heat. And so, as time passes and more evidence comes in, he suddenly changes directions and tells us we're trying to get to the bottom of this. Now he's on the side of law and order. Jiu-jitsu, really. We're, we're trying to get to the bottom of this so we can get the facts out to the American people. That's always a nice touch, American people. In fact, at this point, he might even say, I'm willing to trust in the fairness of the American people. Clearly, he's preparing us for something. <laughs> And so, when finally all the facts come out and our subject seems quite guilty, he employs that sublime use of the passive voice, mistakes were made. <laughs> mistakes were made, don't look at me, probably someone in my office. <laughs> Things are moving faster now, mistakes were made is rapidly overtaken by there is no evidence, no one has proven anything, eventually I will be exonerated, I have faith in the American judicial system, and that certain sign that things are closing in Whatever happened to innocent until proven guilty? <laughs> Whatever happened? Well, nah, yeah. Well, he's about to find out. And we know this must be true because the next thing we hear from him is, I just want to put this thing behind me and get on with my life. I just want to put this behind me. That's an expression we hear a lot these days in all walks of life from people in all walks of life. Usually the person in question has committed some unspeakable act. Yes, it's true, I strangled my wife, shot the triplets, set fire to the house, and sold my young son to an old man on the train. But now I just want to put this thing to the thing. Get on with it. 
That's, that's the problem in this country. Too many people getting on with their lives. I think what we really need more of is ritual suicide. You know? Never mind the press conferences. Get the big knife out of the drawer. Personally, what I want to do is to put this, I want to put this thing behind me and get on with my life, thing behind me and get on with my life. I'll repeat that for you. Personally, I want to put, I want to put this, I want to put this thing behind me and get on with my life, thing behind me and get on with my life. And just to round out this section, let's hope there's a special place in hell reserved for those who have recently decided to take responsibility for their actions. That's the big thing now, taking responsibility for your actions, like it's a recent discovery, you know. He's taking responsibility for his actions. Well, isn't that wonderful? Ask him if he's willing to take responsibility for my actions, along with my alimony, my car payments, and my gambling debts. Now, con continuing with more of these uh, more general language complaints, and forgetting the Washington angle for the moment, I'd like to mention America's love affair with euphemisms and euphemistic language. I think Americans have some difficulty dealing with reality and have invented a kind of soft language to protect themselves. And this tendency to euphemize, if that's a, a verb, uh, increases, it, it seems, with every generation. Here's an example. There's a well-known condition in combat when a fighting man's nervous system has been stressed to the breaking point and he's either snapped or is ready to snap. In the First World War, that condition was known as shell shock. Simple, honest, direct language. Two syllables, shell shock. Almost sounds like the guns themselves. That was over 80 years ago. Then an entire generation passed, and in the Second World War, the very same combat condition was called battle fatigue. Four syllables now, takes a little longer to say, doesn't seem to hurt as much. Fatigue is a nicer word than shock. Shell shock. Battle fatigue. <laughs> then we had Korea, 1950. Madison Avenue was riding high, and the very same combat condition was called operational exhaustion. We're up to eight syllables now, and the humanity has been squeezed completely out of the phrase. It's absolutely sterile, operational exhaustion. Sounds like something that might happen to your car. <laughs> Finally, of course, there was Vietnam, and given the lies surrounding that war, I guess it's no surprise that the very same condition was called post-traumatic stress disorder. Still eight syllables, but we've added a hyphen, and, and the pain is now completely buried under jargon, post-traumatic stress disorder. I'd be willing to bet that if we'd still been calling it shell shock, some of those Vietnam veterans might have gotten the attention they needed at the time they needed it. But it didn't happen. And one of the reasons, I'm sure, is because of that soft language, the language that takes the life out of life. And it does keep getting worse over time. I'll give you a few uh, less, uh, a few more, but less a, a dramatic examples. Sometime during my life, toilet paper became bathroom tissue. <laughs> I, I, I was not consulted on this. It, it just happened. Sneakers became running shoes, loafers became slip-ons, motels became motor lodges, trailers became mobile homes, travel, pl travel plazas, I'm sorry, truck stops became travel plazas, and used cars became previously owned transportation. <laughs> Manicurists evolved into nail technicians. At about the same time, store clerks became product specialists and sales associates. Employees became staff, uniforms became career apparel. Maids became room attendants, and room service became guest room dining. Information turned into directory assistance. Medicine turned into medication. The dump turned into the landfill. Gambling joints turned into gaming resorts. Sh shacking up, living together, reruns, encores. Uh, encore presentations, forgive me. Uh, monkey bars, pipe frame exercise units. <laughs> Wife beating became intermittent explosive disorder, and constipation became occasional irregularity. Rain forests and wetlands came into existence because the environmentalists discovered people were not willing to give money to save jungles and swamps. And... <laughs> All of this happened in the last 30 years. When I was a young man, if someone got sick, they went to the hospital or they went to the doctor. Now, the health maintenance organization sends them to a wellness center where they consult a health care delivery professional. 
Poor people used to live in slums. Now, the economically disadvantaged occupy substandard housing in the inner cities. And we can't really discuss euphemisms if we don't mention that final taboo, death. Used to be that when an old person died, the undertaker put him in a coffin, and we sent flowers to the funeral home where they held a wake. Then after the funeral, they drove the dead person in a hearse to the cemetery, and his body was buried in a grave. Now, when a senior citizen passes away, the mortician places him in a burial container, and we send floral tributes to the slumber room where the grief coordinator supervises the viewing. After the memorial service, the funeral coach transports the departed to the Garden of Remembrance, where his remains are interred in his final resting place. Some of this language can make you want to throw up. Well, perhaps engage in an involuntary protein spill. Now, if all of this begins to put you in mind of so-called politically correct language, or politically correct speech, excuse me, uh, then you and I are on the same track. So let's visit that playground of guilty white liberals, the land of the politically correct. In recent years, the PC folks have found some new ways of shading the truth in order to make people feel better, especially minorities. One of the newer phrases making the rounds is happens to be. He happens to be black. I have a friend who happens to be black. Oh, I see, yes, yes. <laughs> like it's an accident, you know. Happens to be black. Yes, he happens to be black. I see, I see, I see. He had two black parents? Yes, that's right, two black parents. Yes, I, see. I see. And they had sex? Oh, indeed they did. Yeah, I see. So where does the surprise part come in? I should think it would be more unusual if he just happened to be Scandinavian. Another favorite uh, term, recently favorite term, is openly openly gay. I have a friend who's openly gay. But that's the only minority they use that for. You know, you wouldn't say someone was openly black. Well, maybe James Brown. Yes. James Brown. Yes. Or, or Louis Farrakhan. Louis Farrakhan is openly black. Colin Powell is not openly black. Colin Powell is openly white. He just happens to be black. And, and while we're at it, when did the word urban become synonymous with the word black? Did I sleep through this, perhaps? Urban styles, urban trends, urban music. I was not consulted on this at all again. Didn't get an email, didn't get a fax, didn't get a postcard. That's fine, let them go. So I would like to tell you how I handle some of these speech issues concerning minorities. First of all, I say black. I say black because most black people prefer black. I don't say people of color because it's dishonest. It means precisely the same thing as colored people, which is an insult. So if you're not willing to say colored people, you shouldn't be willing to say people of color. And besides, to me, the whole idea of color seems a bit specious, really. I mean, what should we call white people? People of no color? <laughs> isn't, isn't pink a color? And in fact, white people are not really white at all. They're different shades of pink and olive and beige. In other words, they're colored. <laughs> And, and black people are rarely black. I see mostly various shades of brown and tan, and in fact, some light-skinned uh, black people are darker than the darkest white people. I'm sorry, lighter than the darkest white people. Look how dark the people in India are. They're dark brown, but they're considered white. May I see the color chart, please? <laughs> people of color is an awkward phrase that obscures meaning rather than enhancing it. What shall we call fat people? People of size? <laughs> I also don't say African-Americans. I find it cumbersome and confusing. Which part of Africa are we talking about? Egypt? Egypt is in Africa, but Egyptians aren't black. They're like the people in India. They're dark brown white people, but they're Africans. So why wouldn't an Egyptian citizen who becomes a, uh, I'm sorry, an Egyptian who becomes a U.S. citizen be called an African-American? The same would apply to South Africa. Suppose a white racist from South Africa becomes an American citizen. Couldn't he call himself an African-American? <laughs> If for no other reason than just to bother black people. <laughs> and, and what about a black person born in South Africa who becomes an American citizen? Is he an African-American or is he a South African-American? Or is he simply a South African-American, African-American? <laughs> you know, it's just so much more tedious liberal labeling. Liberals should be taught that labels divide people, and I think we could probably do with fewer labels, not more. Now. 
Uh, one more group, the Indians. I call them Indians because that's what they are. They're the Indians. There's nothing wrong with the word. First of all, it's important to know that uh, Indian, that word, probably does not derive from Columbia believing, uh, Columbus believing he had uh, reached India in 1492. India was called Hindustan. More likely, the word derives from Columbus's description of the people he found here. He was an Italian who spoke, spoke very poor Spanish, and in his written accounts, he called the Indians una gente indios, a people in God. In God, indios, Indians. It's a perfectly noble thing. And I simply can't justify this awkward phrase, Native Americans. First of all, they're not natives. They came here from Asia over the Bering Land Bridge. In fact, there are no natives anywhere in the world. Everyone is from somewhere else. <laughs> All people are refugees, immigrants, or aliens. If there are natives anywhere, it would have to be people still living in the Great Rift Valley in Africa. So everyone is just visiting. <laughs> so much for native. As far as calling them Americans is concerned, well, how can I say this? We steal their hemisphere, destroy 500 cultures, kill 20 million, stick the rest of them on the worst land we can find, and then as a special bonus, <laughs> We name them after ourselves. It's, it's embarrassing. It's just embarrassing. The truth is most Indians are insulted by the term Native American. The American Indian movement will tell you that. If you wish to please Indians, try calling them by their traditional names, Pawnee, Mohawk, Navajo, Seminole, and so on. Now, just uh, rounding out this theme and to make you a little more uncomfortable, <laughs> here are a few further, further examples of tortured modern language designed to soften reality, make people feel good, and in general, dress things up a little. Somewhere over the years, the word cripple has been lost. We don't have cripples anymore. Turns out we never did. All this time, they were physically challenged. It's an attempt to make people feel better, physically challenged. And how's this one? Differently abled. And if you insist on using differently abled, then you must include all of us. We're all differently abled. Each of us can do things the other can't. Differently abled. The word crippled is not a dishonorable word. There's no shame in it. Jesus healed the cripples. He didn't engage in rehabilitative strategies for the physically disadvantaged. <laughs> and we have then this continuing problem with the word fat. I use that term because that's what fat people are. They're fat. That's why we call them fat people. They're not large. They're not stout. They're not chunky, hefty, or plump. And they're not big boned. Dinosaurs are big boned. And they're not necessarily obese. Obese is a medical term. And they're not overweight. Overweight implies there is some correct weight. There is no correct weight. Heavy is also a misleading term. An aircraft carrier is heavy. It's not fat. <laughs> only, only people are fat, and that's what fat people are. They're fat. They're not exempt. Uh, for, they're not, for example, gravitationally disadvantaged. <laughs> I offer no apology for this, by the way. It's not intended as criticism or insult. It's simply descriptive language. I'm not comfortable with euphemisms. I prefer seeing things the way they are, not the way some people wish they were. Midgets and dwarfs are midgets and dwarfs. They're not little people. In infants are little people. Leprechauns are little people. Midgets and dwarfs are midgets and dwarfs. They don't get any taller by calling them little people. I wish their lives were different. I wish they didn't have to walk around staring at crotches all day. But I cannot fix that, and I'm not going to lie about what they are. There are some people who playfully refer to them as vertically challenged. They're not vertically challenged. The flying Wallendas were vertically challenged. The people who built the Empire State Building were vertically challenged. No shame in midgets and dwarves. I'm a man for the millennium, digital and smoke-free. I've been inputted, outsourced, uplinked, and downloaded. I have software on my hard drive, and I can give you a gigabyte in a nanosecond. I'm factory-authorized, returnable, fully equipped, built to last, and I'm definitely biodegradable. My output is down, but my income is up. I'm tanned, rested, and market-tested, user-friendly and lactose intolerant. A diversified, multicultural, postmodern deconstructionist. I'm a cutting-edge, state-of-the-art, high-concept rageaholic, and I have a love child who sends me hate mail. <laughs> I'm an alpha male on beta blockers, a bottom feeder and a top gun, a Bigfoot rainmaker. I give soft money with hard cash, and my revenue stream has a cash flow of its own. I'm ahead of the curve, riding the wave and pushing the envelope. I'm on board, on point, on message, but off drugs. I take power naps. I take victory laps. I've got a personal trainer, a personal shopper, and a personal agenda. I'm a totally ongoing slam dunk no-brainer with an outreach that's proactive. I eat junk food, I get junk mail, I buy junk bonds, I watch trash sports. I've been dumbed down with smart bombs. I'm in denial, I'm in recovery, but I'm out of the loop. I'm also on the bubble. A high-tech lowlife, anatomically, ecologically, and politically incorrect. An entry-level man with no exit strategy. 
Low rent but high maintenance. Upscale but down home. I got a minivan with a microwave from a mega store in the mini mall. I've been to outer space. I've been to outer space on the internet. I'm a non-believer and an overachiever. Emotionally deprived and market oriented. I have hardcore software because I use the F word in my email. I'm new wave from the old school, and if I'm not at ground zero, you can reach me at square one. I'm gender specific, voice activated, capital intensive, heat seeking, faith based, and work related, but I'm definitely not group oriented. I'm online, I'm in line, but most of the time I'm out of line. I'm cocked, lock, and ready to rock, rough, tough, and hard to bluff. I put the pedal to the metal, party hardy, and to me, lunchtime is crunch time. Thank you. Are there really seven dirty words anymore? that are unacceptable since so many of the original lists are now commonplace in the media. And what would you say are Tipper Gore's seven dirty words? Yeah, uh, those seven words of mine are still, that still holds up pretty well. They're pretty hardcore. One of them, uh, the one that begins with the letter P and is four letters long, is usable now uh, depending uh, if you use the preposition off after it. It's all right. It's all right to be pissed off. They say that all the time. Uh, just don't use it with the preposition on following it. And. And I would imagine, sorry, <laughs> I, would, I would imagine Tipper Gore's uh, seven dirty words, well, they might number more than, more than my own. There might be seven uh, to the seventh power. I really don't know. Sorry. Would you comment in seven words or so on the Internet Communications Decency Act? Yeah, here we go again. Uh, uh, the, uh, the original case that I was involved in, only uh, peripherally really, it wasn't my case. It was the FCC versus Pacifica Broadcasting. Uh, that was when this word indecency, as far as I know, first came into the legal lexicon. Uh, the, prior to that, it was a problem of uh, something being obscene or not obscene. And then they found indecent, another little area to, um, uh, to restrict, uh, strictly for broadcast. Uh, I, I think the Internet uh, might be uh, powerful enough and have qualities to it that are sufficiently um, vast and elusive that, that uh, they'll never really pin it down. I don't think, I don't think they'll, they'll pin it down uh, too well. Uh. As a wordsmith and the author of Seven Dirty Words, do you feel that losing restrictions on speech has cheapened our cultural discourse? No, I, I don't know that I could say that. I, I think euphemisms are, are, are probably, uh, euphemistic language is more harmful. Uh, there will always be language taboos in, in any culture. There are a aspects of our bodies that uh, certain religions have sort of put beyond the pale. And uh, those parts of the body that deal with those functions will always be somewhat, I think, uh, a little bit of this, if not uh, out, outright uh, banned. Uh, I, I don't think cheapened our discourse. I think it limits people. I, I always said I enjoy using all the language. Human beings invented the, all of this language. And when I was a little boy, I was told to look up to policemen and look up to sports stars and to look up to the military. And we all know how they speak. We all know the language they use. <laughs> and apparently, it hasn't corrupted them morally. So uh, I think these, these words are overrated for their power. You mentioned the military. We have uh, several questions on Kosovo. Let me ask them all together and see what you can come up with. Uh, is what we're doing in Kosovo a war or something else? What advice would you give President Clinton for solving the Kosovo problem? And what's your reaction to a draft dodging president leading our UN forces in Kosovo, especially pictures of him shaking hands with the troops? Well, I, first I must tell you that I take, I take most uh, public events and uh, uh, and, and things that occur uh, that I read avidly, I take them rather n not seriously. Uh, it is nice to see that we're up to that humanitarian bombing again. <laughs> I, and and I, I used to complain that all we ever bombed were brown people. Uh, and, uh, and now I've had to revise that. Uh, although uh, I, I would imagine that uh, we've justified the Serbians as being far enough east from Western Europe to classify as some semi-brown group. I, 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 re I really don't uh, have much of an opinion on this. Uh, I, I, watch the, I, see the, I see this culture as circling the drain in ever faster and tighter circles. And I just observe it and enjoy observing I root for that demise of this culture. I root for the demise of this species. It just happens to be my hobby to kind of root for all this stuff to go away and give an, another species a chance, perhaps. I root for the big comet. I root for the big asteroid. I honestly do. I, and I did that before those movies came out. I honestly do. 
I think I think we've had a turn. Let someone else have it. It's uh, all it is now is is the search for dollars and the search for the things that dollars buy. And there's very little of a of a core humanity left. It happens. It, it works on the individual level and on the small scale. On the large scale, it's all a human comedy. It's all a joke. And and I try to treat it as that. I don't do much uh, political. I don't do uh, current events in any of my shows. I, I I just don't. I think it's trivia. So I uh, I just uh, I kind of roll along and. and for everything to go away. You, do you have subjects that are taboo and are therefore not joker material? For, exa for example, John Cleese has commented that he would never joke about cancer. Hmm. Well, my belief is that in, in, in the proper context, if the, if the humorist or, or, the, or the writer or comedian uh, prepares the context uh, sufficiently for the audience, they will go with him into it, uh, depending on, you know, you can say the, the most horrendous of things as long as they're just not said cold, as long as you prepare people and, and bring them along. I don't have any subjects like that. Um, I, I think uh, these recent shootings in, in Littleton, I was very proud of myself because I had an existing piece uh, about this need to send all of these psychologists in after all of these school shootings, the first thing we hear is that uh, the, 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 all the psychologists and psychiatrists and grief counselors and trauma therapists have rushed in to help the children cope. And I made the observation that uh, we're told also in the same breath that these children are killing each other because they're desensitized to violence. They've been desensitized. Well, if they're desensitized, what do they need all this counseling for? And I was just very happy to make that observation on the night of the shooting and the next night because I enjoy having the audience a little bit on edge. And so I have no taboos. Uh, I, don't, I, don't, I joke about things that I care about, so I usually prepare them in a context where they're acceptable to, to folks who aren't expecting them. And uh, I, I, what I always do is I meet people individually whom I've castigated as a group. I always just tell them, well, I'll give you special dispensation because I honestly love and enjoy people one by one. And, and I see the universe in their eyes. When I, when I look at each person, I can see something that I've never seen before. It's when they begin to clot into groups <laughs> that I begin to take offense. You've had some, some experience with substance abuse, but sober now, what advice would you give policymakers in this regard? Well, I'm one of those who, who feels that um, taking the premium out of, uh, out of narcotics and, and, and various other drugs that are illegal would... Uh, uh, you know, if, if, if there were no profit in it, I think uh, uh, some of that problem would disappear. And I think, I think nature has a way of weeding out those who are kind of uh, not going to make it ultimately. And I think it should be up to the, each individual whether or not he's going to make it ultimately. Uh, my own uh, the, the quitting drugs, and I, I was a cocaine freak. That was my um, weakness. At that time, I, I saw it as a strength, I guess. Um, the way I quit was just to stop. Uh, I didn't go to a program, I didn't join a thing with steps in it or anything. I was lucky in that respect that I was able to just cut down my use slowly. Same with alcohol, just cut it down slowly, less and less, uh, less frequently and less frequently, and for shorter and shorter durations until one day it just wasn't there at all. Uh, I have a feeling that, um, that uh, there's too much reliance on, on people holding hands and, and wishing for things. I think you have to kind of look and see the, 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 the relationship of pain to pleasure. These things are always pleasurable when you begin to do them. And as the time goes on, the ratio of pain to pleasure changes. And pretty soon it's mostly pain and very little pleasure left in it. And that's when the intellect should take over and say, you know, this is kind of stupid. And it's costing an awful lot. That, that's what happened to me. And I, I have no prescription. Public policy is not my area. I'd say um, uh, perhaps legalizing these things would help us, would help the Darwinian side of things uh, sort us all out. Question. Where, where, where are the future George Carlin's or Henny Youngman's hiding? Where, the, well, you know, this is an odd thing. There, this is a, a career that is that is not chosen for itself. Most people choose to get into comedy to now, especially to get their sitcom or to set themselves up for another step, the sitcom or the movies or whatever. I, I came into it hoping to be an actor and hoping to to be perhaps something like a Danny Kay or a Jack Lemmon, and I found I couldn't act at all and was forced to remain on the road and figure my life out. And as I remained on the road, I got better and better at what I did. I found that it was an honest craft. And in fact, that art was involved. It's well, art was a friend for many years, so why not? <laughs> but I, I, without sounding pretentious, I, I do like to point out that, that there is an artistic process involved with observing the world, interpreting it, and then uh, writing something about it and performing it. It's the low end of the scale, perhaps in art. It's not fine art, 
but it is art, and I found that out, and it gave me a purpose, and uh, it gave me uh, some strength, and, and I stayed with my comedy because I found out I was much better at it than I ever expected. I do a little acting, but I love writing comedy and, uh, and delivering it, so I don't know where the new ones are because they don't choose to do this for a lifetime beforehand. It either happens that way or not, and I, uh, I'm happy it happened that way to me. What should Al Gore do to lighten up? I have only one observation about Al Gore. I think he will never be president because he pronounces the indefinite article a uh, as a. He says, there is a plan. We have a plan with a provision in the plan. And there, there is a person, you know, it, it's just very, it's very off-putting. I don't think the American people will tolerate that. Can a candidate for president of the United States be funny and presidential at the same time? Well, Dole didn't make it and Stevenson didn't make it. <laughs> And they had genuine humor. I mean, they had humor that came from inside. Uh, John Kennedy was as close as we got to it, to the perfect uh, match of a little bit of wit and style and, um, and, and the great power of the White House. Uh, I, I, I don't know. I, uh, I think they're all afraid of that. Uh, Bob Orban would know, would know a little more about that, having written things for, uh, for many presidents and, and politicians and, and aspiring uh, presidents and politicians. Um, I think uh, they're funny enough they don't need to add anything to it. You've often talked hilariously about your Catholic education. On a more serious note, have you found any lasting value from attending Catholic schools? I attended a rather odd school. In, in the 1940s, I attended a school that's still in existence, Corpus Christi in New York City. And it was not a typical uh, Catholic ex grammar school ed education. It was not a typical experience. For one thing, uh, we had boys and girls together we did not wear uniforms. The, uh, the, 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 the desks were all movable, and there were no report cards. There were no grades or report cards of any kind. We, uh, we were right across the street from Teachers College in Columbia University, where John Dewey had promulgated most of his theory. And our pastor was a fan of the John Dewey approach to education and insisted that the nuns who taught us have master's degrees from secular institutions. He didn't want them from Catholic universities. He wanted the ones who had been out uh, seemingly at least in the world for a while and they were wonderful there was no corporal punishment and uh it was a, a, a garden it was a place that, that let me flower i don't know what i might have done or how i might have been had i had that rigid discipline and in fact when i got to high school i was faced with the irish christian brothers after leaving these wonderful gentle dominican nuns to the irish christian brothers and they were uh, i think instrumental in my leaving school i i quit school after night or in the middle of ninth grade so I think the brothers and, and the stern discipline are what uh, helped, helped abort uh, my formal education. Do you have any good behind-the-scenes stories about uh, filming TV series That Girl with Marlo Thomas? That, that was when I found out I couldn't act. <laughs> it, was, it was amazing to me. I just thought it was a birthright. I thought, well, I do. That's what I do. I'm, I'm here, this now, and I'll just be that. I'll just go and be that. And I found all these extra things you had to do. I had memorized my lines. But now they're saying things to me like, as you come down the stairs, remember, the divorce is in progress. And the phone rings. It might be the lawyer. It might be your wife. Keep that in mind. And by the way, stay to the left side of the staircase and don't stand in her light when you get to the bottom. And try taking some of those lines a little bit slower. And if you could, uh, take your hand out of your pocket and then put it back in there and turn once. It was just, you know, I was a nervous wreck. I just... <laughs> I did poorly, I deserved to, and it's, it's one of the things that, that propelled me. Nothing behind the scenes that I can recall. I'm lucky to recall it at all. What do you regret most about the 60s? Well, the 60s are somewhat misnamed because it lasted well into the early 70s and didn't really get going till the middle of the 60s, but um, what do I regret most about the 60s? Uh, not very much, I must tell you. I've had a lucky life, and I've had a, a very uh, good good life in terms of being able to live out my dream as my childhood dream and uh the 60s were just a one more good decade for me I've, I've had a lot of good decades and that was the one where i went through my own transformation i was a kind of a what i think of as a mainstream comedian for about five years with some fair, fair success on variety shows and first line nightclubs and and i found out i wasn't really content i was kind of entertaining people who didn't care and I had a lot of other things I wanted to say so it was the 60s that created that that turnaround for me it was because there was a counterculture that I said well there's another audience there are people who are a bit rebellious as I feel I am and maybe I should be entertaining them that's what changed my life that's when the four gold records happened and that's when everything took off so a uh, very little negative I can say about the 60s 
a certificate of appreciation here for you, suitable for framing. Thank you very much. <clears throat> and right uh, next to the National Rifle Association yeah. one. That I have. <laughs> the uh, much coveted National Press Club yeah. mug. This will get a lot of use. Okay. And uh, for our final question, where's Christy? She needs to be ready for this. Uh, was yesterday your birthday? Yes. Okay. You want to tell us how old you are? 62. 62. We have a uh, surprise for you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear George. Happy birthday to you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.